All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get started. First off, welcome back to our weekly Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. It is Quality and Safety Week, and we have two presenters today. We have Dr. Peter Pronovost, who um, could not be with us today, but has a pre-recorded video that we will be sharing. Um, we will be discussing zero harm, and we do have Dr. Patrick Runnels here in person to discuss workplace resiliency. Now, Dr. Pronovost is an anesthesiologist, critical care physician, teacher, researcher, patient safety, and value thought leader health system executive and author of over 800 peer review publications focusing on patient safety, ICU care, quality health care, implementation science, evidence-based medicine, health care value, and the measurement and evaluation of safety efforts. He is also a frequent speaker on the topics of quality safety, value, population health, leadership, and implementation of large-scale change. In his current and prior roles, he has led a transdisciplinary research team doing large-scale implementation science that has content and interdisciplinary expertise in all aspects of the proposed methodology. Dr. Patrick Runnels uh, attended medical school at the University of Missouri in Columbia, co completing his psychiatry residency at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, as well as Public Psychiatry Fellowship at Columbia. In 2018, he completed his executive MBA at Case Western. He is currently the Associative, Associate Chief Medical Officer of Population Health for the University Hospital's Healthcare System in Cleveland, as well as the Director of Adult Clinical Psychiatry for the Department of Psychiatry. In both roles, his focus is on improving efficiency of and access to behavioral health services at the regional level, as well as developing value-based models of healthcare delivery across a, diverse, a di diversity of patient populations. Prior to that, he served as the medical director for the Centers for Families and Children for eight years, which included oversight and implementation of one of the original 13 SAMHSA PBHCI grants, as well as the other models of integrated care and workforce development. Academically, he's an associate professor at Case Western School of Medicine, where he is the director of the Public and Community Psychiatry Fellowship, which has graduated more than 50 fellows over the past decade and which has pioneered models of interprofessional training and distance learning. And now with that being said, I would like to introduce Dr. Peter Pronovost, and we'll be sharing his video, which is about 24 minutes right now. Hello, and welcome to Quality Week. I'm Peter Pronovost, and I serve as the Chief Clinical Transformation and Quality Officer. And today we're going to discuss how do we work towards zero harm from diagnostic errors. You have well heard our journey of zero harm, making sure that we eliminate physical harm from complications, that we eliminate emotional suffering from having a poor experience or not feeling listened to, from eliminating defects in value, things that just waste money with no benefit, and eliminating inequities. Diagnostic errors cause all four of those types of harm. They certainly cause physical harm. They're incredibly emotionally stressful if you don't know your diagnosis or it's wrong. It wastes money. Getting the diagnosis wrong leads to a whole cascade of therapies that are often not needed or the wrong therapies. And we know there's inequities in diagnosis. Indeed, the Society for Improving Diagnosis in Medicine, just last year, I co-chaired their annual meeting that was explicitly focused on inequities. So let's talk for a minute about what do we know about the scope of diagnostic errors. Now, it's interesting because diagnostic errors are not talked about very much. Indeed, in the Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine, report to Urs Human, Diagnostic errors were mentioned two or three times, and yet the scope of the problem, it's one of the major causes of harm. I think that's in part because diagnosis is so entrenched in our self-identity as a physician or as a provider that when we get it wrong, it's quite painful. So here's what we know. 10% of deaths seem to have a significant misdiagnosis. This data comes from ICUs where they looked at autopsy data. 10 million people are impacted by diagnostic errors each year in the U.S. 80,000 people roughly die from a diagnostic error, but I'll share with you that number is likely grossly underestimated because it only includes hospital. It doesn't include chronic disease. And what do we know about chronic disease? 50% of people with chronic disease are not diagnosed. This, by the way, includes our own UH data where we looked at 
people with diabetes who have a high A1C but no label of diabetes. We also looked at people with low GFR and only 50% of them have a diagnosis of CKD and those that didn't had about $6,000 more annual spend than those who did because they weren't being properly managed. Hospitalized patients, um, mostly in the ICU, but some data from hospitalists that lack a diagnosis are three to five times more likely to die. And let's unpack that a little bit. You've all sent patients in the ICU or the hospitalist where we scratch our head and we're not sure what's going on. We're giving therapy and we're, but ambiguous diagnosis. But too often we don't lazily say not diagnosing them or not getting the right diagnosis is an enormous risk and that we need to put focus efforts on getting a diagnosis because when we don't have it, three to five times more likely to die. And what's intriguing is we used to think diagnostic errors were all the zebras, the very rare disease, but that's not so. 75% of all harmful diagnostic errors fall into three domains. We kind of call them the big three, cancer, vascular disease, and infections. And so if you're focusing on this, those are where the money is. So let's spend a few minutes thinking about diagnostic reasoning and how we're thinking about improving that. And it's really what you do every day, and that's Bayesian thinking. Now, I don't want to be afraid or scare you with this Bayesian thinking, and we certainly aren't going to do math, but it's really important for you to understand the mental thought processes that you go through hundreds of times a day to make a diagnosis. Now, much of that is subconscious, and that's because it might be inefficient if you have to make it conscious. But for risky diagnosis, my plea is that you're more mindful and intentional about these thought processes. Okay, well, what is the diagnostic reasoning or b this Bayesian thinking that we do? Well, it's really quite simple. It says whenever we're trying to make a diagnosis, we first have a pretest probability if, if the patient has this condition. Whether that's heart failure or sepsis or dehydration, and we assign that a, a, a probability. We then get some more data in the form of a test. And tests have properties of sensitivity and specificity. And we interpret how good of a test it is in something called the likelihood ratio. And mathematically, likelihood ratio is sensitivity over one minus specificity, or more simplistically, it's the ratio of true positives to false positives, or even more simply, just think of it as how many times more likely am I to have the disease than not have the disease? Now, you don't need to memorize likelihood ratios, but you need to know how good of a test it is to, to decide how much weight to put on it. As you know, any one single blood culture doesn't have that high of a likelihood ratio, so it's why we do three of them usually. And then the combination or the product of those two gives you your post-test probability, and then you need to decide is that probability high enough to say, I'm going to do some treatment or not? So let me give you an example of this from my world in critical care. I'm looking at a patient and I decide, okay, I think they're about a 40% success rate of extubating them. You know, not getting extubation wrong could c cause harm. And so I do a tidal volume to a respiratory rate to tidal volume ratio test. And that test, if it's under 100, it likely means their high probability of being reintubated. The likelihood ratio is under one, maybe you know, even closer to 0 0.5. And so if I started with a 40% probability and I had a respiratory rate to tidal volume ratio of right around one, or excuse me, 100, that takes my post-test probability down to less than 10%. Now, let's say I do that respiratory rate to tidal volume ratio, and it's down around 60. Well, that gives me a likelihood ratio of over 10. So that means two of those together, I'm 95% sure I could successfully extubate this person. Now, that post-test probability doesn't tell you whether I should extubate the patient. You then need to incorporate to the risk of being a false positive uh, 
or a false negative on that. W what does that mean? So let's say I deciding whether to extubate the, the patient and I have two patients. One has cervical mets to the spine and is a halo. The other is a 18 year old trauma patient who the tube's really irritating them, but they were an easy airway. So if I fail on the tube on the trauma patient, not a big deal. If I fail on the spine patient, I could par paralyze them. And so you use this reasoning every, every day. You take some information in, in a form of a pretest probability, you get some more data in the form of a test, and then the two of those together give you your post-test probability. So let's talk about some strategies for mitigating diagnostic errors and risks from diagnostic errors. And we'll go through how it impacts each of this diagnostic reasoning process. The first is make sure you create a culture and structure that encourages diverse and independent input into the diagnosis. The reality is we know the wisdom of crowd works that people on a team have diverse ideas and input. And if we create a structure and a culture that allows them to speak up, we can get a much better diagnostic. But too often, we don't have that. We either don't have the structure, meaning we communicate by Doc Halo or through text, but we never form a team where the different components or the different people making a diagnosis come together and say, hey, you know, what do you think's going on? Here's how I'm seeing it. No, this is how I'm seeing it. And we come to a collective agreement. Or sometimes we create a culture where there's fear of speaking up, or we have a hierarchy of evidence where only the attending or perhaps the fellow is able to speak up and the nurse, the student, the resident, the family is often weighted less and sometimes actively discouraged from it. I was partnering with an anthropologist from Scotland when we were doing some work on teamwork in the ICU. And one of the things that struck them as the difference between the UK and the US is when we made rounds, we formed a circle. You know, now with the cows, it's more of a blob, but think of it as the circle where in the UK, they made a V and it was along a hierarchy where the consultant, the, in their term for the attending was at the head the fellows or the senior registrars were next to them and then down the line, the hierarchy, and only the attending and the senior registrars were able to talk, right? And what a missed opportunity to learn and tap wisdom, where circles are a symbolic term for egalitarianism and make it much easier for people to provide uh, input, but we don't always do. Uh, I'll share with you an example. <clears throat> we had some teamwork experts observing rounds once, and the we were forming a circle. The bedside nurse was sharing her view of what was going on. And the resident showed up to rounds and was a little bit late and stood right in front of that nurse. And when he did, the nurse stopped talking. Didn't say another word for the rest of the rounds. And nobody noticed because probably it happens all the time that we just got commented on it. And at the end of rounds, that teamwork expert asked people to reflect on how good teamwork was. And everybody said, oh, it was great. We really had, we had a great discussion. And the uh, expert said, well, did you observe what happened when the resident stood in front of the nurse? And, and a few people said, oh yeah, I guess I noticed. And when you asked the nurse, she's like, yes, it felt horrible. I felt like I was d dismissed, that my voice didn't matter, and I just didn't speak, right? And so be mindful of that culture and structures. Second strategy is to honor experiential wisdom as much as book wisdom. You see, in medicine, we have an epistemology, that's our, our theory of wisdom, uh, that says your PGY years or your book wisdom are the most important domain of knowing. And we have a very, very clear hierarchy that we defer to attendings, then to residents, then to, I mean, excuse me, then to fellows, then to, to residents. And that is one domain of wisdom, but it's only one. An equally important domain of wisdom is experiential wisdom, and that is time with the disease or time with the patient. So a parent 
who see, lives with a chronically sick child and tells you, I'm worried, you darn well better heed that because they are going to see things that you will never, ever see. Or the spouse of a chronically ill patient says, you know, I, I live with this person, this, they don't look right, something's wrong. Honor that wisdom. It doesn't take away your authority. It enhances y y your authority because you'll make a better decision. The same goes through for nurses, and nurses also have book wisdom, but they're more often have much more experiential wisdom. They're at the bedside much longer, and so if a nurse says, you know, I've had this patient every day for the last two weeks, I've been sitting at their bedside for 12 hours a day, something's different. They're, they're slipping. They're not right. Again, honor, honor that wisdom. I'll share with you a statistic from a study that we did looking at several health systems, sentinel events, and malpractice claims. What we found was that 90% of those events, 90%, someone knew something was wrong, but either didn't speak up or spoke up and wasn't listened to. That's an awful big price to pay for not having good teamwork. Another great tool is to create and use a diagnostic checklist and automate those when possible. We are looking at COPD patients in medicine, and many of them, as you all know, have a label of COPD, but no spirometry. We have no idea what diagnosis they have, but we don't systematically have a checklist to diagnose people. Uh, same thing for CKD. We just built a checklist in the EMR and built a machine learning trigger. So now if people have a GFR that's low, their primary care doc gets notified, they get called in, and we have a standardized approach, but we've used preciously few of these checklists. On rounds, if the patient doesn't have a diagnosis, like I mentioned, that's a risk of three to five fold increase in mortality, call it out and say this patient is diagnosopenic. We need to focus our efforts very quickly and get a diagnosis, and if we don't have the right special in there, let's get other consultants in to help us or call a bedside huddle. You know, rounds, if done well, are a beautiful tool for team decision making because they generally create the structure and culture to bring diverse teams together so you get diverse and independent input. But there's no need you only have to do that once a day. If someone's deteriorating or you're not sure what's going on, Call a huddle and just get the teams together and say, okay, what do you see going on? What do you see? Let's try to mature our uh, thinking. Now let's look into how we interpret the likelihood ratio of tests because we make a lot of mistakes in interpreting those tests. And one of the biggest mistakes we make is assuming the fallacy of 100% sensitivity and specificity. Let me give you an example. I wrote about it in the safety book. I wrote uh, Safe Patient Smart Hospitals. There was a gentleman, 42 years old, donating a kidney to his brother. The person donating was very fit, worked out, quite muscular, and the procedure supposedly went fine. It was done laparoscopically. Afterwards, the patient really wasn't making any urine. He got several liters of fluid, the uh, surgical team said, let's put them in the IMC so they can get some better monitoring, go to the IMC, get a CAT scan on the, on the way to this IMC that showed some fluid in the pelvis, but otherwise normally. Over the next four hours, the patient gets now a total of about nine liters. His belly is blown up about to here. His pH is 6.9, and he's in significant respiratory distress. Comes into the ICU, needs to get intubated, speak with the surgeon and said, this patient's got to go back to the uh, uh, OR for an exploratory laparotomy as a surgical complication. The response was, no, the CT was negative. He can't have something. And I said, they're, they're not a perfect test. And I'm trying to walk through Bayesian thinking because it's a great way to get assumptions on the table so you could see how different people are reasoning. And I said, you know, there's no medical disease that takes this healthy 40-year-old guy and then five hours later, he's sitting here dying with his belly out to here. Um, I think you have a complication from surgery. No, surgery was fine. We, it was done under laparoscope. You know, uh, we saw the trocars go in. Uh, and by now, his bladder pressure was quite high. He needed to go off for a laparotomy for that and went to the OR. And the trocar had gone through and through his duodenum and into his pancreas, a really quite morbid injury. Um, 
But you say, well, why wasn't the CAT scan show anything? Because they're not perfect tests. No test is perfect. But if you wage your pretest probability to say, I, I don't know anything else that's going to cause that quick of a demise in a healthy person who's just had this surgical procedure, it has to be a look of a surgical because the risk of being wrong is the patient would likely die if we didn't f f fix this. If you, the, the risk of being a false negative is, okay, I did the procedure and uh, he's got an extra scar in his belly. But, so we need to be very mindful of that. The other mistake we make, in, it's similar to 100% sensitivity and specificity, is we put a lot of weight in very low information tests. What do I mean by that? So you'll routinely say, okay, I'm not sure if the, fluid's dry, the patient's dry, so I give them 500 cc's of fluid and their blood pressure doesn't come up or their urine doesn't come up, and I conclude, therefore, they weren't dry. And as you know, well, is that because I had a low likelihood test, I just didn't give enough fluid, or that they really are dry? And so, you know, being mindful that, okay, that probably isn't a, a test that has a really high degree of sensitivity, um, or li likely, in other words, has a very low likelihood ratio, I either need to give more fluid to do the test or be intentional about how I'm weighing the risks. You know, obviously the same thing comes when we want to get a history of sexual behavior or eating or s substance use. You know, we don't put a high likelihood ratios in the test because we know they, people aren't, aren't often accurate. And so just be mindful of um, how much weight to put in that likelihood ratio. F next is when you're deciding next to treat, be very intentional about being a false positive and a false ne negative. Let's go back to that the, the decision to extubate. The false positive is decision is to say, okay, I had the decision to extubate and it was wrong, and now they're going to need to be reintubated, right? And obviously, based on the patient, the risk of being a false positive varies widely. Someone with a difficult airway, boy, I'm going to fix as many things as I could to reduce that risk of false positive because they're gonna suffer harm. On the other hand, it may be the risk of, of not being able to intubate is very low, but the patient suffering from um, a false negative is so high that I really want to uh, take that risk. And then finally, when you review your RCAs and learning from defects and your morbidity and mortalities, make sure you consider diagnostic errors in your review process and consider using this diagnostic error checklist. Now, as you know, think of diagnosis as a process where there's content components to it, there's uh, communication or teamwork, but it emerges over time and you get clear over time. And if in reviewing diagnostic, there's a checklist that you can go through that systematically looks at things like what did we know when, how did we weigh the information. Essentially, it goes through those, those characteristics that I just went through. And so if you have concern about a diagnostic error, pull out this checklist and walk through the diagnostic process. It's a great teaching tool for help learners and trainers understanding uh, how you're reasoning and you're going through your diagnostic reasoning and where you might have pitfalls in um, your diagnostic reasoning. This tool could be used in the inpatient setting or the outpatient setting, but I would encourage you to be more structured in not just saying, oh yeah, I think we got the misdiagnosis or the diagnosis wrong, but let's go through is what was that reasoning process that we used and how could we improve it? Did we, could we have gotten our pretest probability higher by um, speaking with more people? Could we have, had a higher likelihood ratio of tests of, 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 so that we were, had more information. Did we decide our post-test probability um, and the decision to treat may not have been the best one for the patient? So I would encourage you to try using this, and if you do, I'd love to hear uh, back from you. As you all know, our management system towards zero harm is we call it uh, leading with love and, and that is our management system to help ensure that we have uh, zero harm by ensuring success of our teams uh, and then only after that ensuring that we have accountability that we perform the way we should diagnostic errors in many ways 
poses so many threats because it's really painful to think that you might have made a misdiagnosis. Obviously, nobody wants to do that as a clinician, and it's so tied up with our self-worth that when it's, we're at all questioned, we get defensive. And so I would encourage you to approach this diagnostic error with humility, with curiosity, with compassion, but most importantly, with love, so that we are strong enough to be under a spotlight of saying, hey, we may have made a diagnostic error, but yet strong enough to be standing in our own bright light, to have the courage uh, and the compassion to help us make the diagnostic process better. So my friends, as you leave here and hopefully enjoy the rest of Quality Week, I'd ask you to think about what is your I will statement. That is, what might you do to reduce harm from diagnostic errors? Could you be mindful of the Bayesian process and some of those risks that we've talked about? Could you use the checklist to evaluate the diagnostic process when you're worried about a diagnostic error in one of the cases that you review? Could you build better teamwork or communication? Might you call a bedside huddle when you have a deteriorating patient who you're worried about? Might you call out when you don't have a diagnosis, this is a risk for a patient, let's focus on getting a diagnosis. My friends, by applying these principles, we could significantly reduce harm from diagnostic errors. So let's make sure we do, and let's make sure you complete your I will statement. Thank you, and have a great day. And if I'm not mistaken, I'll uh, finish up with uh, my talk, hopefully have a few minutes left at the end for questions. Um, and in order to get the most information in, I'm gonna uh, jump in uh, and uh, we'll, we'll take questions at the end. Uh, so I'm following up Peter's talk here with a talk that has, uh, it is a uh, very related to his talk, but it's not gonna feel quite the same. Um, and it's about thinking about not, in a world in which uh, leaders like Dr. Pronovost are saying, we need to uh, do checklists and we need to be more thoughtful and we need to uh, think about uh, uh, how we're gonna uh, 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 get, get to zero harm. One of the things that is probably popping through everybody's mind is some version of how can I possibly do one more thing? And so what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes talking about the ways in which we are unable to get done what we need to done because we fail to acknowledge the problems that we have and how our work is set up and how our environment is uh, is set up. And then we fail to make the right approaches to make the environment uh, uh, an environment that allows us to succeed and feel good about the work we do. So the first thing I wanna show here is just a, a, a quick snapshot survey. This was a survey done uh, by the federal government of about a thousand healthcare workers from a variety of different parts of healthcare. So everything from physicians to MAs to uh, coders to all this, right? This was a whole about a thousand folks. And they asked them to check every emotion in a list of emotions that would help them, that they were experiencing predominantly in, uh, regularly in the last month. And what I wanna, point out here is that this survey, which is done in the middle of 2021, the first positive emotion is gratitude down here at 31%. Now, we, this survey was done and the thinking here was that people were feeling very stressed and burned out by COVID. But the reality is, is that the vast majority of these feelings were reported by people who were not directly dealing with the direct fall out of COVID. These were things that were happening as a result of the work in general, exhaustion and burnout, this feeling of underappreciatedness, this feeling of loneliness, things that were not necessarily directly related to people getting infected with uh, uh, the virus. And the question leads when we think about surveys like this, the question is, what is it that's going on and why are we feeling this way? And certainly COVID upended things. But something I think it's important to communicate is that it, COVID didn't create new problems mostly. It mostly exacerbated existing problems that were there. And it's worth thinking about that. Uh, one of the things that um, probably all of you are familiar with is this phenomenon, uh, a famous uh, a kind of PhD book that's come out over the last uh, a few years by a gentleman named Cal Newport, uh, created this concept of a hyperactive hive mind, which is how we are doing our work right now, which is a workflow that is centered around these ongoing conversations uh, through unstructured mechanisms of communicating, where you just drop a communication and hit someone else. 
The prototype for this, of course, was email. And we're all familiar with emails and too many emails and this happening. But every time we've tried to kind of deal with that, we just created a new structure that's even worse. For a while, we were frustrated with not being able to communicate with each other in, uh, uh, in medical settings. So we created Doc Halo. And I want you all to reflect right now, both about how great it was to use Doc Halo when it started and how it now has probably already started to be something that is overutilized and bugs you. And unlike texting and email, Doc Halo actually just keeps hitting you with another ping every 30 seconds until I've checked it, which actually probably creates more stress in the long run than it's relieving. That's not to knock Doc Halo. We're trying to find the right solutions. But when you start putting all these tools together, email, the task list, texting, Doc Halo, whatever else you're using, we've got a way of communicating with each other that almost guarantees ineffective communication. And the reason this is ineffective and it's intuitive for us, even if we don't know it, is this problem, which is network switching. It, it takes the human brain about five minutes to switch from one task intellectually to a different task. Uh, that's called the network switch, right? That's our brain shifting from one thing to another. When studies have been done, the average uh, information, high information worker, including healthcare, gets 100 to 200 unstructured communications like emails, tasks, tasks, all that thing a day. And if you imagine all the ways in which I have to shift my thinking every time I get those, because they don't come at us in a structured way, there's no way I can possibly keep up, be effective, and not start to feel a sense of burnout. And this is a real problem as we have gone into a world where we're trying to achieve zero harm, as we have tried to improve quality and started to measure more and more things and started to ask for more and more of this stuff, we are drowning in the requests coming at us from all directions in a way that makes it hard for us to think about what we're doing and effective accomplish the, the most valuable things. And this, by the way, is something I think all of you have experienced to some degree, which is that it ends up being the case that we go to bed at night and wake up in the middle of the night wondering if we answered a text or a, a, an email or something like that. We are on vacation with our iPads and thinking, well, I'm doing notes, but at least I'm on the beach, right? These are experiences that nearly everyone in healthcare I've talked to has. And here's the deal. This is not the only place we're stressed. The rest of the world exists too. We live in a world right now where whatever your political persuasion, whatever is going on, you are probably pretty scared about something, whether that's a fire uh, breaking out in nearly every national forest uh, at the same time last summer or protests for or against police uh, in support of police behavior, or obviously most recently, the invasion in Ukraine, what we are experiencing is a whole lot of external threats. And we pretend as if those aren't things that are coming to work with us, but they are. And they're there. And they're another version of that network switching problem that happens in terms of our ability to focus and feel good about what we're doing. And it also creates anxiety and stress. And these things all come together. And something I don't have a slide for here is we know that healthcare workers are stressed out because about 20% of the healthcare workforce in a six month stretch last year left healthcare. They didn't just leave the job they were in, they got out of the field entirely. The workforce is speaking with its feasts that it cannot keep up with everything we're asking people to do. And our response as a system was some version of individual resilience. And I wanna start by saying individual resilience and efforts to improve individual resilience are really important for individuals in specific circumstances. They're the right thing to do when someone is experiencing a crisis or an unusually stressful time that is gonna surge and then kind of come back again. It is really important that we do the work of making sure that individuals are taken care of when they've experienced something bad. Yet it's also really important to acknowledge, and by the way, every healthcare system in the country took this strategy, um, to acknowledge it doesn't actually work to reduce it at a system level, at the level of all the providers. When we do individual resilience efforts, um, what we find is that they are not effective at uh, reducing burnout. They're not effective at improving wellness. Um, and that a lot of that is because of something we already know, which is that the system around us is actually in very bad shape. We are all this dog animal thing here in this uh, famous meme. We are all this uh, uh, entity. We are all working in a system that isn't right. We all know it's not right. It feels right. It's not sustainable. And we're having our cup of coffee despite those fires being around us all the time, doing the best we can, doing often heroic work to make sure patients get the best possible care or the best outcomes despite the system. Uh, Peter uses the, frames, the phrase defects, and we all know those are everywhere, right? And here's the deal. When we support individual mechanisms of resilience and we support people actually doing 
uh, support trying to help people once things have gotten bad. What we're kind of saying is this, and I'm going to read this quote because I think it matters tremendously. The ultimate pitfall with the way we look at well-being is that we only consider the need to boost resilience and not the need to fix the system. Because what we end up signaling to staff is that we're trying to boost your resilience so that we can continue to treat you badly. Now, I want to be very clear. When I read that aloud, the thing I don't want to say is actually that leadership or HR is trying to deliberately treat you badly, but it is the message and the feeling that people have is the system is set up and no one's dealing with the system as it is. Now, when we think about ways to start to deal with that, I want to really kind of uh, point out two, uh, the two, point, two kind of ways of thinking about this. The first is the emotional side of people being burned out and how you prevent that in the first place, how you kind of start to intervene. And uh, by jumping into this, what I want to highlight here is most of the difficulty we have in dealing with a lot of things we have is this concept of despair and contempt. And if we look down here at this lower picture here, this is a guy in a pit. And he's asking himself two questions. Those questions are, why am I such a failure? That's a stand-in for despair. And why are they so stupid? And that's a stand-in for contempt. And when I have gone around this system, but let's be clear, many systems in the country, these are hugely predominant feelings. People either, they're point, either pointing their fingers at someone else saying, you're messing it up and it's your fault, or they're looking at themselves and saying, I'm messing it up and it's my fault. And in both sense, in, in both settings, uh, they're drowning in a pit and it's not actually getting anything done. Despair and contempt are natural human emotions. They're not wrong emotions to have, but when you get stuck and you get mired in these, and when teams of, in healthcare get mired in these, they become highly ineffective and it kind of becomes its own spiral and things feel not hopeful, right? This idea of reframing and helping teams to reframe away from those two emotions of despair and contempt and towards what, what's called here in this picture, a learner path, are really, really important. There is a way out of this, even when problems are tough, even when workforces are stretched thin, even when EMRs are set up terribly. There are ways to think about solving problems and engaging with other people that help to minimize the negative impact of con uh, contempt and despair and allow us to move forward. And those things involve us asking thoughtful questions and thinking together as opposed to in opposition, um, and then sitting down and having the time to reflect deeply on the right answers and time to work together to create innovative solutions. And the key word in all of those things is time. And that matters tremendously. Now, here's the deal. When you feel, a lot of people think about uh, uh, optimism, uh, you know, and I'll define optimism here. Optimism is a word that means I'm seeing the bright side of things. And interestingly, in uh, when we look at research, uh, uh, optimism on its own is associated with higher rates of depression and higher rates of suicide. Um, and that's because people who are optimists tend to see the world in a way it isn't. Um, and when their world or their view is shattered, they tend to have, they fall into that pit very quickly, particularly a pit of despair. Hope is something very different. Hope is the belief that I can change things despite it all. And that matters tremendously. We have hope all over our culture. We see hope and it is what drives us. This idea that we can do things differently even though they're not really great. And hope is actually associated with higher rates, uh, lower rates of depression than average, lower rates of suicide and higher rates of wellness and satisfaction at work. And when we think about hope, in general, a lot of the work of what we need to do in getting to the point where we are enacting effective uh, ways of uh, uh, getting to zero harm have to do with instilling hope in our teams. And for any of you who have followed uh, uh, the uh, 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 news over the last two weeks, there has been at least one beacon of hope amid the awfulness that has happened in Ukraine. And it is that they have a president, Zelensky, who has gotten on and despite every opportunity he had to get out of there and save himself, and he's a wealthy man from his uh, prior work in entertainment, uh, he stayed there and has done everything he can to give his nation hope. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be an amazing outcome, but the entire populace of that country is 100% united against a terrible invasion, against terrible odds, despite it all. That's hope. 
Now, I don't mean to suggest that healthcare is the same as a war in Ukraine, but it's worth noting that when we look around and see what's going on, there are actually tons of solutions, innovations, if you will, to a lot of the most pressing problems we have in the way our workforce is built that actually have an evidence base for reducing the uh, burnout and improving wellness uh, in, in, our, in our provider workforce. And this is just a few of those things. Um, but to get to those, you need to get to a point where you're not just getting to, the, where you're not just seeing all of the work as a series of tasks that are endless that need to be done. And when we think about the way we approach work, what I will say is that as you start to get more and more isolated, as you start to have trouble uh, in a, engaging as a team, we all have the natural tendency to want to just make everything uh, uh, about running through us, doing everything, because it feels like a lot more work to do those things. And here's the deal. Most of the solutions that we have in our workplace aren't things that require, you know, are, 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 the, are the, shall I say, the most important solutions are not things that require us to do specific things. It requires us to be a very specific way. When you think about leadership in general, but this is true of how we practice, the most effective leadership is what we call wise compassion. People that understand that things need to get done, but also approach those things and care deeply about culture and how team and team dynamic and a range of other things. And the way one leads in that setting, uh, none of these things say things like, does it uh, Excel spreadsheet really good? Or uh, is really good at working through a checklist of things. That's not actually in here at all. It's a lot of other things. It's about being with people and helping them be with each other in a more effective way. One example of this for people to look at, and with all seriousness, um, uh, I, I point this out, is a show called Ted Lasso. For those of you who have not watched the show, it is a master class in a leader who comes in and actually helps teams function better by removing despair and contempt. That's the whole show. Uh, without getting into the plot too much, to watch this show is to watch someone who goes in and clearly has hope that things can be better despite a sports team that he's been hired to help uh, having tremendous dysfunction. And each episode has him, the Ted Lasso, the main character, going through and systematically addressing one dis component of despair contempt. And by the end of the first season, the team isn't winning all the games. But man, it has hope like nothing you've ever seen before. And it leads to better things down the road. For any of you who have not seen this show, it is well worth reviewing. And if you can only do one show, uh, do episode four, season one. But it's a perfect example of what it looks like. And let's be very clear, the show is a fantasy. It's not real. But it is a great example of how you comport yourself to get a team to work more effectively. Now, when we talk about team, I want to go over a few things really quickly because teamness matters. You can't do checklists and hit zero harm without teamness. Peter referred and alluded to the idea that people need to feel safe and they need to have a speak up culture. But all of those things stem from having an incredibly well-oiled team. Now, there are a lot of aspects to team to think about. Here are some things that matter deeply and tremendously. The first is team functions better when team cares deeply about each other. And if there's a lot of contempt within a team, getting together and just having compassion meditation can go a tremendously long way. Having people be able to have space to think with each other, not about the great job they did on a task, but about the great way they helped each other uh, when it wasn't necessarily something that was expected, how they went out of their way. There is research to show that meditating on other people's acts of compassion makes me more likely to be kind and compassionate in the near future. Setting up times so where people can do that matters tremendously. Um, verbalizing that it's okay to make mistakes create uh, 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 is, is a big part of trust. And it must be that the most powerful person in a team does that and shares their own mistakes and makes sure people see that they're okay doing it. Spending more time with friends, and I'm gonna to get to this in the next slide, but time matters. And the ability to care about the people you work with matters deeply. Peter shared that story about a huge team that came into round on a patient and a resident stepped in front of a nurse. And the point of the, the, me bringing that up is to kind of point out, I wonder how often those two parts of the team, the nurses and the physicians and the residents actually spent time getting to know each other, right? I don't know, but that's something to think about. Um, using the principles of the learner path as I've, I've talked about and making sure incentives are aligned are also key and important things. 
Building team though matters deeply and we build team by creating very intentional spaces and they come with things like highlighting roles and responsibilities, highlighting how to communicate most effectively, making sure that people are immersed in an environment where those things can be suffused and then making sure people are competent in it. And health systems in general invest in a little bit of this, but we need a whole lot more of this going forward for any of us to be able to accomplish the things we want. And that requires this investment of time. And people are so stretched thin right now that it's hard to imagine this. But if we do not invest the time, we will not get the results and you will not be able to realize the uh, uh, ideal of a, you know, a, a, a zero defect environment. Time often is spent, by the way, on this quadrant one, things that are coming in front of us, things that are crises, things that we need to handle and deal with in the moment. And those things feel really intense. If we are having some people, uh, uh, you know, having terrible clinical outcomes, we have to pay attention to that, right? We end up spending all of our time here without ever carving out time in, in uh, this quadrant, in quadrant two, which is the long-term stuff. That's the place we need to spend time as teams building better solutions so that we don't have those quadrant one problems in the future. I have seen precious little of that happening. We do do it lip service. I see retreats all the time that never result in ongoing action in a regular way to, start, to, to, to staunch the bleeding so that we don't have to put band-aids on problems in perpetuity. It is putting band-aids on problems all the time, by the way, that burns teams out. So to the degree that we need to improve and make teamwork better, we need to invest in that time. And it needs to be pretty outsized, by the way. It needs to be a pretty large amount of what we do so that we have time to, to deal with the most urgent problems as we see them. But this, we have to do this a whole lot more. Now, we imagine when we solve problems that the people who solve problems are special beings. It is someone like Peter Pronovost, that guy is capable of solving problems, but not me. And we have these fantasies of good looking doctors and stethoscopes leaning on walls who are the ones that are gonna be the uh, ones that kind of save everybody and uh, are innovative thinkers. We have this fantasy and it's wrong, right? The reality is the best innovations are a mix of people thinking uh, thoughtfully and reflecting on their own and then bringing ideas to teams and having safe space to toss ideas around and figure out how to do things. And when we think about some of the most intractable problems, for instance, like the nursing workforce shortage we're dealing with, that is not a problem that's going away. We're acting right. We're putting band-aids on it, band-aids on it, band-aids on it. We're not going to have that go away, but it is not going to be solved by someone with a magic idea coming in. It is going to be solved. That innovation is going to be solved by promoting teamwork and putting the time aside for teams to do great redesign of workflows. And that design thinking is the other necessary piece. We have to create space and time, not just for people to be part of a team, but for people to actually attend to that future-oriented work. How are we going to make it better? How are we going to implement a checklist in a way that doesn't have us all drowning in even more paper? So in summary, oh, I did that pretty well. I uh, want to kind of leave with these ideas. Team building must be a proactive, positive, uh, must be proactive, positive, and must be given ample time and seen as a core and urgent task. And it, almost every environment I've been in is not enough. And workflow redesign must be proactive and must be given ample time and seen as a core urgent task. And I have seen preciously few uh, parts of our system, but really of systems around the country where that's the case. So I'll stop there. Um, I think I can take us off sharing here. I hope that both Peter's and my talk gave you guys some good food for thought. Um, and um, <laughs> thanks, Keith AFC Richmond. Yes, uh, one of the, that's the team in, uh, in uh, uh, Ted Lasso. Ted, by the way, Apple TV is like seven bucks a month. Do it for a couple months, watch the show. It will instill at least some sense of hope that you can come back to your own environment and actually do things differently. So I'll stop there. That gives us about 10 minutes perhaps for questions and I'll pass it back to the moderator. Thanks, Patrick. That was great. I think, um, you know, Ted Lasso would be a really wonderful attending on the NAF team because um, he's collaborative. He supports his uh, junior partners. He's a good problem solver. He's open to ideas. He's pragmatic. And that's the goal we have for our attendings and acute care and critical care teams. So you're, you're, uh, but what you and Peter said hugely resonated with me that you know, teaching us what is when you have different layers of learners, if you, if you combine, I often say, you know, the very experienced attendings have their own biases, sometimes anchoring biases, and then the third year student has no anchoring biases. And if you synthesize everyone's sort of knowledge, attitudes, people feel free to make suggestions, ask questions. It's a better, safer problem solving enterprise in a clinical setting. And that's, that's what we strive for in the Department of Medicine. So Thank you so much for that. And um, big fan of Ted Lasso. So 
Nice shout out. <laughs> I, I see one question here from a, a, a Vasu Sidigam. Um, the top uh, two or three reasons uh, the provider's resiliency is threatened. Number one is task overload by a lot. People don't know how to respond to tasks. They, you know, in my work, I'm in population health. I work with Peter and we do these fun talks. Let's do this quality metric. Let's do that quality metric. We're going to go around. We have great ideas about all the quality stuff you can do. Um, I did a talk on depression screening in primary care. That was really the whole talk was five minutes was here's how to get credit for depression screen. Uh, and it was a two, two or three step process, right? And I was talking about it in the middle of that talk on the chat screen, it was a Zoom talk, uh, a primary care doc who I actually know well and care deeply about, think he's, think he's great, um, puts in there a very simple thing. Uh, hey, look, I get depression. This is not a problem with mental health, but if I get one more thing on my plate, I don't think I can make it. I can't handle all, it's gonna break me, right? And after he did that, there was a beat of about a minute. And then I got 15 more chats all saying, thank you for saying that to this person. I feel the same way. And so that this concept that we can hit this idea, realize this idea of high value care by just adding more and more stuff to people's plate without helping people get approach their work in general differently is wrong. Uh, the other piece, uh, the other two pieces I see all the time, uh, number, number two is a uh, uh, lack of communication. So people don't have an easy time communicating. Uh, and uh, the, the other piece is unclear roles. So those three things are the big, big, big things. You know, it seems like as we go throughout our day, we have this accumulation of tasks, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's one reason that emails are less and less an effective way of communicating because emails are seen as just another task and they're quickly deleted if people think it's not something that really pertains to them. And anyway, it's you know, uh, I give this example all the time and I pull people and the, the people in this audience can simply reflect. When we talk about emails, um, uh, uh, what happens with that uh, uh, hyperactive hive mind is some variety of this all the time. And this is how most people use email anymore. Keith emails and say, hey, Pat, let's get, there, get together and talk about a clinic. And I say, great, Keith, what are you thinking? And then he says, I don't know, what are you thinking? And then I say, well, maybe we could talk about uh, diabetes in the clinic. And he says, diabetes, interesting idea. And we keep going back and forth like that for email after email. And the reason we're doing that isn't because we don't want to talk about it. It's because we're trying to discharge the email task with as little work as possible. <laughs> Everyone has figured out how to do that. You all know exactly how to do the minimum necessary so that you're not being rude, answering an email without actually effectively accomplishing deep communication in a way that people want, right? That happens all over the place. It happens with tasks. It happens with emails. Anytime I sit down and do a thoughtful response by email anymore, I get these, uh, I get a response most of the time with someone saying, oh my gosh, I wasn't expecting that. And in reality, all I did was type, I don't know, five or six sentences that I put thought into for a few minutes. That's so vanishingly rare that people are now thankful it happens, right? You have a good uh, e memory of our email exchange with the Douglas Moore Clinic. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it was, we were both wanting to talk about yeah. this. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. By the way, I can answer questions about Peter's talk as well, if people have questions yeah. about that. There's a, a, Dr. Sadeh has a question in the chat, Patrick. What do you think about the effect of email about finishing your notes and tasks? So, um, yeah, so right, this is a good example. EMR, uh, P, Peter actually uh, uh, talks this all the time. There is not a single study that shows that EMR improved anything related to outcomes. What we do, you know, ever, like period, end of story, we do know it's created a lot more work, right? But that's not just EMR. That's how we approach the work. I think we, uh, we, we make the mistake of thinking it's just the fact of the EMR, like there wasn't a lot of after hours charting when we were on paper charts because that had different problems with it, right? And I existed before paper charts and I was documenting after hours just as much there and I couldn't do it at home with a glass of wine. So that was worse. Um, so I say all that because that said, we are wildly over and uh, kind of attached to the EMR as how we center our work. We need to get away from that. There are a lot of studies that show different ways we can do that. For some people, scribes work incredibly well. For other people, concurrent documentation works really well. In both cases, the people I know who do well, and when you look at this in studies, 
Uh, this, this is demonstrated over and over again. The people who do well are ones that minimize their documentation. EMR needs to kind of start to go that way. I find it flat unacceptable. I talk to primary care docs all the time. That's a population I'm around a lot. I'm sure this is echoed in the uh, hospital side uh, who go to work at seven uh, or 7.30, do their work, finish up, see the last patient at 5.36, go home, have dinner, and then sit down from like 7.30 to 10 and do nothing but documentation. And that's just normal for them. They say it without blinking an eye. And I find that unacceptable. That's not appropriate. You can't be great at what you do if you are working nonstop all day, every day. It's just a reality. We have tons of studies to show that. And yet it's what we all do now. It's just happened. And it's because tasks have piled up and we never thought to change the chassis out. We kept doing things exactly like we were always doing. But as things got more complicated, we came up with more answers and, we, and, and diseases had more complex uh, things associated with them. We just never solved for that. We just kept doing it the same way. So the short answer there, uh, Eli, is, Absolutely, we can change this. There's actually evidence as to how we can do that, but it requires time and investment to do it. Uh, Mimi Singh, uh, how are you engaging system leaders about building systems reports? So we do actually have a committee right now that's starting to look deeply at this. And we've identified areas related to empowerment, communication, and teams. And we are in the, we just started meeting a few weeks ago, um, a few months ago. Uh, you'll start to hopefully see pieces and parts of this. This is not something that Cliff McGarrian can come in with a wand and wave a wand and say, be more efficient. He can sit there and stand. I guarantee you, if he comes in and watches a dysfunctional workflow, he would support anything you need to do to change it. The thing is, it has to happen at the local level. We need to help empower people at the local level to effectively engage in this work. So it's, a, uh, it, it's not something we're going to have a solution from on high drop down. It's something where we build this in, this resiliency into how teams function and help teams themselves feel more empowered, more capable, communicating better in, in, in terms of getting those solutions implemented. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Ramzan, I, you know, just to, yes, uh, agree with that. EMR is uh, primarily uh, a tool for billing. Uh, that's how it was, in, that's how it was built. Um, and that's interesting, you know, uh, uh, this idea of what can we do to kind of force radical change. Ellie, you talk about maybe we should block off EMR. You can't get to the EMR after seven. Uh, that would probably drive the uh, billers nuts, but it would be a radical step that we, we should think about things like that. And you throw that around. What can we do to make sure people do their work differently? Now, that might be one that's not tolerable to, 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 the, to the system and one that might not work if I want to go, I don't know, see a musical and finish up a brief note at, at night. But it's the kind of thing we ought to be thinking about more. Um, what do you some think about some of the uh, again, some of the remedies for the EMR are scribes, which I know urology uses scribes a lot. Um, I just I, I in my outpatient clinic, I use time based codes, which requires a lot less um, yeah. you know, meet, meaningless documentation. In ID, we do tend to, you know, maybe spend time, but time based codes have uh, saved my sanity in terms of uh, the way I write notes and then bill. So I'll make one last comment on Dr. Ferris's uh, um, uh, comment here, which is this idea of having other team members do certain tasks. Yes. And also, by the way, I can't tell you how much physicians struggle to let go of tasks. It is so hard. I watch this happen over and over again. They get a whole great team and then everything's still got to flow through them. We haven't even begun to crack the surface of how to make teams the most effective, but it requires everyone radically rethinking their clinical identity, not in terms of their expertise, but in terms of how they approach the work. And it is absolutely the case that the right answer to a lot of this is we need to allow different routes and different ways for solving the most important problems. And physicians don't need to be in front of most of those, much less all of them. So I'll stop there. Uh, it's one o'clock. Really appreciate you guys' attention and questions. And uh, I'm always available by email. I'm in the system if people have further questions or want to talk more. And uh, I'm having medicine grand rounds. That was awesome. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Have a good one, everybody. Yep. Bye.